Hi, my name is Devin Flickinger, and I did my PowerPoint presentation on Colgan Airlines Flight 3407. Uh, the overview, uh, Colgan Airlines is a regional airline operated for continental connection. On February 12, 2009, around 22.17 Eastern Standard Time, a Colgan Airlines Flight 3407 was on an instrument approach to Buffalo International Airport, Buffalo, New York, uh, when it crashed into a residential area about five miles from the runway. Um, the two pilots, two flight attendants, and 45 passengers on board the airplane were killed. One person on the ground was killed, and the airplane was destroyed by the impact forces in a post-fire crash. Uh, the captain of this flight was named Marvin Renslow, age 47. Uh, he was hired by the airlines by September 2005. He had 3,379 total flight hours, uh, 111 hours as captain on the Q400 which is the aircraft he was flying. And also you should mention that he had five failed check rides. Uh, the first officer for this flight was Rebecca Lin Chong, age 24. She was hired in January, 2008. She had 2,244 total flight hours. Uh, she had 774 of these hours in turbine engines, aircraft, and also the Q400. So she actually had more hours than the captain did on this type of aircraft. Uh, the maintenance records. Uh, two line checks were performed on this aircraft during that day before the accident uh, when it arrived into uh, Albany International Airport. The de-ice detector probes and the de-icing boots were visually inspected and they said there was no discrepancies with the de-icing boots at the time at that day. A review of the accident airplane's logbooks from April 2008 to February 2009 uh, revealed no chronic issues with the airplane's primary or secondary flight control systems. Uh, also, no discrepancies with the primary or secondary flight control systems were reported after the airline's last L1, L2, and A checks. Um, the Q400s for this airline was pretty much new aircraft. Uh, as the regional airlines were growing, they kept continuing to take in new aircraft. Um, so these aircraft maintenance was, you know, pretty par. Uh, the causes. Uh, the weather was a big issue with this flight. Uh, here's the METAR, the 2154 METAR for Buffalo, indicated winds from 240 at 15, gusting 22 knots, visibility 3 miles, uh, light snow and mist, a few clouds at 1,100 feet AGL, ceiling broken at 2,100 feet AGL, and overcast at 2,700 feet AGL, temperature 1 degree Celsius, and a dew point of minus 1 uh, degree Celsius. So the METAR of this airport was showing uh, mostly IFR conditions. Also, it's at night, um, so the weather definitely played a big role. Uh, there's most likely icing conditions. And also, two other aircrafts reported icing conditions around the time of the crash. So there was definitely icing conditions, uh, which does also plays a big role into this accident. Um, the air carrier training. The NTSB found that the current air carrier approach to stall training did not fully prepare the flight crew for an unexpected stall in the Q400, um, especially the, they did not train the pilots correctly for the Q400 to a fully developed stall. So that they found that the pilots were not properly trained to handle this type of stall for this type of aircraft. Also, even though the pilots were not fully taught about the Q400, about the stall, the pilots should have known the basic stall recovery procedures as pilots were always taught this from the very beginning, even from our private pilot days all the way up until our ATP and so on and so forth. Um, the pilots incorrect responses. Action by the, the, the pilots and the correct response. So failure to monitor the airspeed along with the rising low Q of the airspeed. Uh, lowering the airspeed should have been corrected. Notice and power should have been applied. So as we see from the black box recordings that the airspeed continued to lower to a very dangerous speed also, when the co-pilot put in the flaps and they also lowered the landing gear, that's when the airspeed really started to drop. Um, the pilot should have noted this and they should have added power. Uh, the incorrect response from the stick shaker by the captain. Um, the captain should have pushed the stick forward instead of back. So when the stick shaker went off, the captain, by the black box recordings, pulled back on the stick, which put the airplane into a nose up position instead of a nose down position. So the aircraft continued to stall, which he put the aircraft into a more dangerous type of stall. Uh, the captain only put in 75% of power. So instead of 
you know, in your, going into a stall, you should definitely put 100% of the power. The captain only put in 75% of the power. And also, the first officer retracted the flaps. Uh, retracting the flaps reduces the lip. So since the aircraft was into a stall, uh, didn't put full power in, the first officer also retracted the flaps, which, you know, produces less, less lip. Um, so with the added weight from the icing additions, uh, the aircraft definitely did not have, was producing enough lift. Uh, failure to maintain a sterile cockpit. Uh, pilots should not be having random conversations during the approach. So again, the black box recorded that the captain and the co-captain were having just random conversations in the cockpit during the final approach, which is obviously one of the most dangerous parts of flying is the approach. So a sterile cockpit definitely helps make sure you're focused on the landing and uh, getting to the ground safe. Uh, maintaining the correct airspeed during icing conditions. Both pilots mentioned that they saw ice on the plane. So noticing icing buildups on the plane, the pilot should have flown the approach at a higher airspeed. So again, the black box recordings stated that the, both the co-pilot mentioned that she saw heavy icing conditions on her side of the plane. And also the captain acknowledged that he's never seen so, many, so much icing build up on the plane before. So both of the pilots knew there was icing on the plane, and if there was such big icing buildups, then there was probably a greater ice buildup around the plane, which causes the aircraft to be more heavier and also produces less lift. So the airplane definitely needed to be flyer at a higher approach speed than it was. Uh, the avoidance, uh, proper training on the type of aircraft. Uh, once again, every aircraft that we fly is different. So even if you're transitioning from one turbo, prop aircraft to another like the Q400, it's still a different airplane, it still flies differently, different engines, different power. Uh, so definitely more training for the pilots. Uh, more experienced captains on the type of aircraft and needed more pilots. So uh, as we saw, the captain of this aircraft only had just over 3,000 hours, which is still not much as a captain, uh, especially captains at regionals. You know, you get the first officers who are just fresh out of ATP, uh, getting into the airline industry, you need to have these experienced captains to be teaching the first officers everything that they know. So that way when they get hired as a captain, they have the experience and they have the knowledge to deal with situations like this. Uh, better training for pilots includes stalls and winter flying. So also the NTSB said that these pilots were not properly trained on the aircraft for these stalls and also training for different type of weather situations. Um, as we all know, the United States is big. There's weather different all over the United States from flying on the West Coast, that could be hot and sunny, and then transferring to the East Coast, which you can run into winter conditions, snowy conditions, and definitely icing conditions. So better training for the pilots, uh, cutting training for pilots to go fly. Uh, at this time, the regionals were growing really rapidly. Uh, so I feel like the training was cut. Uh, the pilots were not getting a proper training just because the companies knew that when these planes are sitting on the ground, they're not making money for the company. So I feel like we cut the training short, that way they get the pilots out on the line to go fly their planes to make more profits for the company. Uh, fatigue. Fatigue, the NTSB said the fatigue was not one of the main causes for this crash, even though it was brought up multiple times. Uh, we know that, the, for instance, the co-pilot flew from Washington all the way to the East Coast, um, and she did not stay at a hotel, she did not get a proper rest. She was caught, you know, sleeping in a crew rest. Um, also, the black box also caught her stating that she was tired, and also she was getting sick before the, they took off for that flight. So also, the fatigue plays a big role of maybe why the captain or the co-pilot, you know, retracted the flaps during the stall, why the captain maybe pushed back on the stick. Uh, during the stall instead of pushing forward on the stick and putting full power in to recover from that type of stall. Also, the airlines need to have better crew rest. Um, so the airlines at the regional level, especially the regional level, um, pilots aren't, you know, they don't get the proper crew rest. They can be working 16 hours a day and only getting paid six, maybe six or seven of those hours a day. Uh, pilots know that they need the hours, they need the hours to grow up, to be a captain, and to move on to the bigger, major airlines. So regional airlines, I feel like, take advantage of pilots uh, for this type of reason. Also, community across the country, they definitely need to have better uh, community, um, community policies. 
Um, most of these airlines are in expensive cities like New York, uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, and most of these regional pilots cannot afford to live in these types of areas on the salary that they have. So a lot of regional pilots are commuting to the work. So that means adding maybe an extra day before the flight or maybe an extra day at the end of their flights. Um, so they're not getting a proper sleep cycle and a proper rest. 